Hi, I'm Cassie, host of the Curiosity Junkie podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, please hit the subscribe button to follow us and receive new episodes each week. If you really enjoy the podcast and you're feeling generous, please hit the donate button. We work hard to create original content and keep the podcast ad free. Today's guest is the author of A Thought is a Thought, a book designed to calm the mind of anyone that suffers from anxiety and overthinking. Please welcome Nikki Hedstrom to the podcast. Hi, Nikki. Welcome to the Curiosity Junkie podcast. Hi, Cassie. I'm so happy to be here. I am happy to have you on. So let's talk about your book, A Thought is a Thought. Yes. Yes. So basically what happened was I was a child who grew up with anxiety and it's sort of taken my whole life to find different tips and tricks and tools and practices that I could bring into my life to help soothe my own anxiety. And I just sort of had one of those lightning bolt moments one day where I was like, why, why is there not a version of this messaging that I've been, you know, books I've been reading and resources I've been collecting. I'm like, why isn't there something that we can distill for children? Because if I had learned essentially that like a thought is a thought when I was younger, I could have shortcutted so much pain and suffering. And so I, I started mulling that idea around. And one morning I woke up to the refrain, a thought is a thought is not me. It's just not. And I was like, what? (laughs) This is it. This is it. So I I love stuff like that when it happens. Oh my gosh. So I grabbed my laptop and I ran in my room in the dark and I typed out this rhyming poem, which really just captures some of the main things that I find helpful, which is when we're feeling anxious, we need to get still. We need to take some deep breaths. We need to calm our minds. We need to like let those thoughts um, get out of the past and out of the future and into the moment. And when we do that, we're so, we're so much better equipped to you know calm our nervous system, to reset our thinking patterns and most importantly, I just wanted to make cognitive behavioral therapy something that families could use at home. And so with that, you know, I have the story, but I wanted there to be exercises because as we all know, if you don't practice sort of when we get those negative thoughts and start to question them, like, is that thought true? Um, is there another thought I could choose that might be more positive? And so I've been making that a habit through the lessons I've learned through therapy and through reading lots of different books. But when you get those thoughts, I'll ask myself, like, is that is that thought true? And then work to create something more positive. And I thought, oh, my goodness, like if I had learned that the way like it's when you're a kid, you're a sponge. And so yes. learning lessons is so much easier. I'm like, if I got in the habit at a young age to just question when a negative thought comes in, like, is that true? And then asking myself, can I choose another thought, one that might be more positive? Like what a game changer that would have been instead of now where I'm, I'm trying to create old ruts and create new roots to pathways that are a little bit more positive. And so I got inspired to put this book together. Um, and I, as I, I think about it, I'm like, I think it's a book for the whole household because when we read it, it's a reminder to us all, whether it's a day, a bad day at the office where you maybe you feel like you bombed a meeting in the boardroom when you really haven't, you can probably check in when you're like, is that really true? Like maybe, yes, maybe you're being hard on yourself, but would you say that to your best friend? Like learning to talk to yourself like you would somebody that you love. And so that's really putting all these pieces together to help families just come up with better ways to equip us to have more positive thinking. Yes, I, I love it. And thank you for sending me the electronic copy to to go through the moment I opened it and started reading through it. It just took me back to Dr. Seuss. And I think that's a wonderful thing. And the message in it is what really kind of hit home. And when you said it's really for the whole household, absolutely. Because that was my thought too, as I'm reading it, I'm like, this is good for me too. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. I think about, oh my gosh, if I had had this as a parent, what a what an awesome tool want to kind of get into the anxiety piece of it because that's really what this is about right when we have those thoughts that kind of just start taking over and they're never positive thoughts they're on the more negative side what made you want to put the exercises in the back yeah i wrote the the poem which is essentially a rhyming scheme like you said it kind of has that dr seuss feel to it because it does rhyme but 
it's such a big concept. And mm -hmm. even as adults, when we read works like Eckhart Tolle or, um, you know, we, it can be hard for us to process how to put it into practice. And so what I thought would be helpful for the family is to actually have these worksheets that take it out from just being a story um, and a poem of sorts into an actionable thing we can do. And so I really wanted kids to walk away with tools in their in their toolkit to be able to use anywhere they go. And so there's really the main exercise that we have in the book is one, the thought exercise, which is really a, based on the idea of cognitive behavioral therapy. And that if we get mindful about the thoughts and I love that you like curiosity, right? Like how do we get curious about the thoughts that we have? Think about almost holding that thought in your hand. How do you Think of it as almost external to yourself. Like, what is that thought that I'm having? Um, is that thought true? And if I can choose another thought, one that might be more positive, what would it be? And I think even just checking in with the feeling of in your body and the emotion that's attached to that thought, because sometimes we just get overwhelmed and we're not even we're not even connecting on that level to be like, wait a second, like I'm feeling really um, I'm feeling butterflies in my stomach, or I'm feeling, you know, my heart is racing. So thinking through what is that emotion that I'm feeling? And then ideally, when possible, shifting to a more positive thought and a more neutral or positive emotion. And so I always love the example um, to help parents when they think about if they buy the book and they want to do the exercise, or even if they just want to take this idea of the exercise, is yeah. that think of your child, for example, waving at a friend across um, the, the playground at school, and their friend doesn't wave back. Now, the first gut emotion might be hurt. And it might be based on the thought that my friend doesn't like me. And so when they think my friend doesn't like me, the feeling is hurt. And the response might be, well, I'm not going to talk to them. The action is negative. It's not going to help mend that relationship. However, if you can work with your child to say, well, let's, let's get curious about this. Like, are you sure? Is it, do you know that that's true? Do you know that your friend doesn't like you? And you can either have them think about other pieces of evidence, almost like a like a court case, you know, like, well, well, they invited me to their birthday party and yesterday they shared their cookie with me. And, you know, there might be some things that were proof points that they seem like they are your friend. And then you work through what are some of the things you can think about that, like, what could be some other reasons? Well, maybe they didn't see me. The emotional charge to they didn't see me isn't hurt, right? Like your emotion to that is like, oh, well, they didn't see me. So I'm going to go over the action then becomes I'm going to go over and like, say hi louder, right? And so you can see how quickly when we start to shift that thinking that, and get curious about the thoughts that we're having, how quickly we can shift from one negative emotion into a more positive or neutral one. Like I said, when your friend doesn't wave at you, doesn't necessarily make you sad, doesn't make you mad, doesn't, it's, you're sort of indifferent about that situation. And so my goal is to help kids get a little more curious when they do get those thoughts to ask, is that thought true? And then work through that process of thinking like, how can I, how can I look at this differently? And I think with um, a child anxiety on the rise that we need more tools to help kids work through these negative thoughts. And as you've said, once we get one up pops another, and then there's another, and it's just, it can get really spirally. So what I want to do is try to work towards interrupting that first thought and start to question it before we get into a pile of other negative thoughts that we don't want to be processing. So uh -huh. And it's funny, as you're talking, I'm thinking, oh, that's kind of sad that little kids probably go through this same thing <laughs> in, a, in a more innocent way, I'm sure. For sure. For sure. Yes. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Yeah. I don't know why that just struck me. Like, yeah. I, of course they have anxious thoughts. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think of like, you know, when you felt like somebody left you out and whether they did or didn't, you know, they were probably just so excited in the moment that they just sprinted ahead because they were, you know, excited and not because they were trying to leave you out. But I remember moments like that growing up that you would feel either left out or, and that's something you, I feel like lots of parents talk about, like, oh, they felt excluded. And so sometimes you just need them to reset to be like, well, did you, like, did you try to go join them? Like, you know, working through. And um, I think conversations around that, just the general notion of let's talk about the thoughts that you're having instead of internalizing those thoughts and letting yourself sort of be in your own space, encouraging that openness within the family. Um, but on that note, in the positive thinking piece, you know, the, the second tool that I have in the book is positive affirmations. And what I love about positive affirmations is that I, when we build that self-confidence um, from their own perspective. So I am kind, I am smart, I am brave. When they say those on a regular basis, when something negative does come in, they've got a higher reserve 
because it doesn't align with their own visuals of who they are. And so it's, I think about how when we were growing up, I'm sure you feel the same way. There was a like I was a gold star collector. I loved, you know, I loved to get that praise. And I know that a lot of the time that was the way that it was framed up. You know, we weren't being told like to say, I am smart. I was being told you are smart. Um, and so I was always looking externally for that validation. And I think that's fairly like fairly significant and, and an indicator of our generation. Whereas what I love about affirmations is that we're really trying to instill that confidence from their own person. And so ideally when they hear those things that they can brush them off or at least question them and ask if it's true and work through that. But if they believe that they're smart and somebody tells them that they're stupid, hopefully that belief system is stronger than that one voice that they've heard that one time. And so you can let that go because as we know, some of those childhood wounds carry with us right up (laughs) into our adulthood and it takes some work to unwind those negative belief systems so I just want to try to do what we can to shortcut or to stop some of that those those bad negative beliefs from becoming something that become an ongoing story that we tell ourselves as adults yes yes and and that's so true we we definitely take that stuff all the way into adulthood And it's interesting because like I came to kind of the self-awareness piece late in life, uh, you know, my early fifties. And I think, oh my gosh, this is such a wonderful book because you're talking about this early on, like from the get go, even that's my intent. I'm going to give it to my brand new grandbaby. (laughs) And it's, it's just, it should be a huge shift in mental health Mm -hmm. just embrace having these conversations right from the get-go well it's really hard to grasp that like a thought is a thought like it's just a thought and we can let it go and it's not who you are it doesn't define who you are you can choose another one um there's so many ways that like it for me it's I love the way that Eckhart Tolle describes it he's like who's who's the person looking at the thought Like Mm -hmm. you are the person who's looking at that thought. And so there is an awareness and a self that is separate to that thought. And so it's, it's easy before you kind of think about it to just take those inner voices that you hear as face value. Mm -hmm. And the goal is to really shift that into being curious (laughs) and questioning and to move yourself towards the type of person that you want to be, or to have the belief systems that you want to have. Mm -hmm. And I think we all live a happier life when we choose to give ourselves, not only ourselves, but others, the benefit of the doubt. And I love, um, I use a thought as a thought for me, like as a reminder, even when, um, you know, say for example, I, people can get really critical about it. Like you text somebody and you don't hear back from them for a few days and you just start to think like, oh, well, I'm just not a priority to them. And what, like that little voice comes in, yes. that your we'll ego comes in. What they, what I do, why are they mad at What me? did I do? <laughs> what did I say? Um, something's, go- something's gone wrong. And then you finally connect with them and they tell you that they just found out their mom has breast cancer and they've been dealing with that. And you're like, oh, wow, (laughs) look at I get in my head and self like in my self absorbed ego, thinking about all the reasons it had something to do with me when it really had nothing to do with me. And so I like the a thought as a thought, um, as a reminder that when that thought comes in that like, that's just a thought. And like, ideally, you just wait until like in the present moment is, is the only place you can be. So when the time comes, that's right, you'll talk to your friend, you'll find out, you know, were they stressed at work, were they whatever it might be. But we stop ourselves from allowing that ongoing cycle of like, man, we try to be fortune tellers and we try to guess what the future holds and try to predict what people are thinking. But it's such like so much energy expense um, with very little value, really. And so it's such a good, good reminder to just be in the moment, to be present um, and really to not take things personally, which I got that lesson um, when I was in my early 20s reading um, The Four Agreements. And oh, I love that book. I can never get through. I reread it every so often. Yeah. And it'll hit you in a different way, depending on what stage of life you're in. And you'll be able to say, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, that's where (laughs) one of my favorites of The Four Agreements is the don't take anything personally. And just remembering that like, so often our lens is to take that personally when there's so many factors and variables in other people's lives that we get, we get lost in our own heads thinking that stuff's about us when it's really not. So 
just my recommendation is when you have those thoughts come in just to say to yourself, like a thought is a thought, it's not me. It's just not. And you let that go until you're in that present moment with that person to have that conversation where you can get to the bottom of maybe a difficult conversation or whatever that might be. But yeah. <laughs> so yeah, Absolutely. I, and I really do think the self-awareness piece is so important. Like just slowly becoming aware that you're having those thoughts. That was the first, I think, big aha moments for me and that reading Eckhart and um, Thich Nhat Hanh and just a lot of that. And, um, this is the book I have sitting right here right now. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, you know, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I, it's, it's, it's funny, but I, I remember that really being the moment when I heard the thought and it wasn't actually connected to me. I could see it for the first time and it wasn't taking over. And then I could stop and kind of reframe. And uh, having lots of conversations lately around anxiety and perfectionism. And I, I just think that first step is really that self-awareness piece. So this book speaks right to that. And the choosing, choosing another thought, like this sounds kind of funny, but I, I love using the example of driving in traffic, somebody cuts you off and your first thought is like, that guy's a jerk. <laughs> um, and what I love to do is just to say like, I'm going to choose another thought. Like maybe he's racing home because his wife's in labor. That might be true. It might not be, but it, I'm never going to know anyway. So you know what, when I say like, he's, he's got somewhere very important to be, and there's a reason that he's going that fast. I feel different. I feel much like more empathetic. I feel much more compassionate when I think that he needs to be somewhere in a very urgent way. Um, But we often just jump to the most negative version we can think of. And we let that get in our, in our day or ruin our mood. Um, And I often think of that, you know, when the cashier uh, clerk is grouchy that I'm like, you know, there's probably something going on. It's none of my business what it is anyway, but I, I guarantee there's something bigger going on than what I'm seeing in this exact moment. And by having that grace and empathy in that moment, I just keep like, you know, I just kind of keep myself in my own lane um, in a much more positive way. And honestly, it's funny that we don't think about this, but that first thought is just a thought and you can quickly and just as easily choose another one. Um, And maybe neither are right, but if you choose one that makes you feel better, why not? Yes. I love that you use the driving example because I can't remember where I read it or saw something. And they said, instead of becoming angry in that moment that someone's cutting you off, they always just assumed that that person must just have to really go pee (laughs) They're in a hurry. They're looking for a gas station or something. So get out of their way because you can totally appreciate what that feels like. I was like, there's empathy, I, right? Yes, I love mm-hmm. that example. That's fantastic. And clerk, the same thing. Like, I always try to think about, you know, something's going on. And I, I'm one of those, I want to do my best then to make their day a little brighter. So I absolutely go out of my way to be like super nice to them. It's grumpier. If, you know, if they come at me grumpy, I'm like, oh, you're going to smile before I leave. <laughs> need a little love. <laughs> absolutely. Well, talking about the affirmations, do you have a practice or like, um, I have a journal practice that I do every morning and I say my affirmations and, and all of that. Do you have a practice like that yourself? I do, I have a bunch of different tools that I use. I, I mean, I do love meditation. So I like guided meditation. Um, I do love the abundance, like Deepak Chopra abundance, 21 days of abundance one I'll do over and over again. I really enjoy that one, but I also love to put stickies up around my house. So in my bathroom, when I open my vanity, I have, um, and like an affirmation that I read to myself, but I also love to ask like outside of some of my favorites, but uh, I am courageous because I like to put myself out of my comfort zone daily. You know, I wasn't doing podcasts a year ago. Here I am doing them now mm-hmm. and just w- working towards things that make me uncomfortable that I know are good for me. So um, <laughs> I like to use that one as a reminder and that I am kind because I think that helps me make sure that I'm making that a conscious choice everywhere I go whenever I can. Um, but I also love asking open-ended questions. So like the um, the course in miracles. so the where would you have me go? What would you have me do? 
Um, what would you have me say and to whom? I love to ask myself that as I go into circumstances that like maybe it's a big um, conference or something. I like to ask myself that before just to almost make me conscious that there is these opportunity for me to um, do something great. And so I, I love doing that as a practice. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I like that. That's a great one. And staying right here, right and now. Open, right? Keeping that yeah. openness, open yeah. to the circumstance, being present, watching for the opportunities. Um, all of those things are important to me. But what I didn't talk about was the last um, tool in the book, which is breath work, which is super oh, gosh, important yes. to me as well. Um, I've, I've found it to be so powerful in helping regulate myself. And so I, again, I wanted, I'm like, that's something kids can have with them anywhere they go. We all, anybody can do it anytime. And so I wanted to encourage parents to teach their children how to do breath work, especially when it comes to like test anxiety and stuff. Sometimes just a few deep breaths can help them get that focus back in place and not be in that space. I know for me, test anxiety was a big one. So I, I just... think it's for every kid, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. That math test getting slid onto your desk. Woo. <laughs> Everything just goes true. And all the thoughts you start having. Yes. Like, no, turn those off. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, your book is amazing. How would someone get a copy of your book? Yeah, it's available on Amazon if you're looking for it there. And um, it's actually carried. So I'm in Canada, so it's carried at Indigo. Um, it's also online at Barnes and Noble. So really, if you and you can buy it through my website, a thought is a thought dot com. And yeah, there's lots of places. So honestly, I'm sure you could request it from your local bookstore if you want to support um, independent bookstores. I'm sure they can bring it in for you. Yeah. OK, very cool. And I'll put the links to all of that in the description so everybody has access to easy click and you're there and you can buy the book because it really is a wonderful book and um i think the message is fantastic and it has the exercises in it so we're not just saying this is what you should do it has the step-by-step -step, here's some practices that you can put into play immediately with i think for yourself and for your children yeah. And if you have an anxious one at home on a thought is a thought.com, I do have free worksheets. So if you want to download them and do them at home, I've got the positive affirmation worksheet. So one, you can print it up and put it on your wall. If you just want to practice them in the morning or at night or whenever that fits into your family routine. Um, but I also have one that kids can fill out on their own because I have a series of affirmations, but if there's other ones that relate to them more personally, you know, you can customize it to whatever suits them. Um, I also have a gratitude journal, which I love a gratitude practice. I think it's so good. It's such a good habit. So whether it's something you want to do over dinner as a conversation or whether you want to have them like as they get older, if they want to write it out, I've got a worksheet for that. And yeah, there's just, if, if you want free resources, there's some coloring sheets because we know I'm um, using creativity and coloring in particular that, that like mind body connection is actually quite soothing. If you have anxiety, that's why those adult coloring books like yes. went bonkers because we all just need to unwind a little bit, but um, there's a series of resources. Also, if you have an anxious child, there's just a lot of information about cognitive behavioral therapy and all sorts of other breath work techniques you can use and tips and tricks. So um, if you're looking for extra support, you can definitely check that out. And that is all on a thought is a thought. Dot com. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. I love it. Well, Nikki, what, um, what bit of advice would you have for anyone getting this book and putting it into play? Yeah, absolutely. I think what's important um, as parents, as we know, is to model that. So if you um, have the opportunity to demonstrate how, how you're feeling and how you're shifting that thought, or maybe a tool that you're going to use to help regulate yourself, I think that's always really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, I know a lot of the time parents want to show that like, they've got it all under control and like everything is great, but sometimes showing, you know, mom's feeling anxious because I have a big presentation tomorrow. I'm going to go for a walk and I'm going to do some deep breathing. And then when the presentation is over, I'm not going to feel nervous anymore. Like talking through that scenario can help them see, you know, that feelings are normal. Like anxiety is normal. Um, I'm going to feel that I'm going to use this tool and I'm going to you know, shit, like I will feel better. It is temporary. So I think having conversations where you can model it is helpful, but using that thought exercise on an ongoing basis. So asking those questions, you know, is like, how am I feeling? Um, what is that thought? Do I know if that thought is true? And then if possible, 
is there another thought we can choose that's more helpful? So working through that practice on an ongoing basis. So, and I will say as, as at somebody as is younger, a lot of the time parents want to fix stuff, right? They want to just provide the solution, but I would recommend for an anxious child, for them to work through that process, to get to the idea on their own. I mean, it might take some coaching, but the, the more you can help them to self-regulate the better off they'll be to be able to do it on their own in different circumstances where you're not there, but also they'll feel seen and heard by you. Because as we know, being told like, oh, don't be scared. There's not a ghost under the bed. Like, well, I'm pretty sure there is. So you just told me like there isn't. And I, now I'm alone and there's a ghost under the bed. So <laughs> working with them to think through how to get them out of that headspace and how to shift that thinking into something different through their own like voice, um, I think is really, really powerful. So I would just encourage to have those conversations as often and um, as possible. Yes, something that popped into my head real quick was that when, when a child is in a moment and, and they're feeling anxious or they're upset, it's gonna show up in different ways. Is that a great time to just talk to them about feelings? Like start question, helping them question the feelings they're having, like right in that moment? I think so. Yeah. I mean, I think what you want to do is make sure that they feel um, that you're uh, connecting with them. Like I felt that way too, is a really great way to open up that door. You know, I, sometimes I feel scared um, and then relating and then having that conversation about like, well, how does that make you feel? And, and there's things like, obviously like snuggling can like in that can bring comfort in that conversation. And so I definitely recommend that, but I think it's totally okay to talk about it in the moment. I mean, that's where they're, that's when they're really churning that thought. And so if, if you can work gently to discuss where that thought's coming from, how that thought's making them feel, and then working through, like I said, allowing them to think through, could they think of it in a different way um, is really helpful. Yeah, that's great. And I love the, the modeling it. And as you were talking, the whole visual of a crazy morning where everything's just like chaos and anxiety and everybody's running around. What a great thing to be able to just kind of have that conversation out loud. Like, this is what's happening. We all understand. <laughs> we just have a lot going on. We're going to get to the other side. It's all going to be okay. <laughs> yeah. And we're like, all of us are feeling and sensing being. So if you're feeling frantic, it's not that your kid doesn't know that you're feeling, like, they'll know that. And obviously it has to be age appropriate sharing, you know, there's ways to do that. I just think it's important to sometimes say like, mom's feeling a little overwhelmed, but you know what? Like we're going to get through today. I'm looking forward to dinner tonight with you. It's going to be great. Like talking through how that's going to, how you're going to get through that moment. It's not going to last forever. And maybe in that moment you are feeling a little overwhelmed. Yeah. Oh gosh. All good stuff. <laughs> I love this. I think this is probably a good place to wrap up. I know you've got a busy day in front of you and I want to say thank you so much for coming on and sharing your book with us and all of the practices in it. It's amazing. Oh, thank you, Cassie. That makes me feel so good. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me and letting me talk about it. I'm very passionate about kids' mental health. So anything I can do to try to help. I love it. Thank you. Appreciate it. And to everybody out there, thank you so much for tuning in, listening, watching. Stay safe, stay curious, and I'll see you soon. If you enjoyed today's episode, please hit the subscribe button to follow us and receive new episodes each week. If you really enjoy the podcast and you're feeling generous, please hit the donate button. We work hard to create original content and keep the podcast ad-free.